Hello world, I'm in the Philippines, but it's not for the reason many foreigners visit, which is to hit up the beaches and have a nice vacation. Instead, I wanted to get a glimpse of the everyday lives of Filipinos. <laughs> Finally, many locals offered to tour me around, and I experienced so much, from the multitude of shops in the Divisoria Market, to the incredible commute in Manila, to escaping the city and heading out to the provinces. Before I get into it, I'd like to remind you that I'm just a person that went to the Philippines for 11 days. While I met with many different locals and did a bit of research, what I present is only my experience and taken from the perspective of someone who has lived in Canada and Japan. I'm going to start my trip with my number one worry, which was safety. Despite looking Filipino to some, I am in fact not Filipino, but I figured with my 5 foot 4 height, okay, 5 foot 3 and a half, that my short stature, black hair, and tan complexion would enable me to blend in a bit better than your average Westerner. Why was I worried about safety? Because countless Filipinos told me to watch out for scammers and pickpockets. And the first scam to watch out for was taxi drivers, so I installed Grab. Fun fact, Uber used to be in the Philippines, but they decided to exit the Southeast Asian market and leave it to Grab. But in exchange, they own part of Grab, so in a sense, they're still here. Now Grab seemed good, but this lineup for the Grab booth at the airport did not. I was kind of confused because I thought the app was supposed to negate having to line up. So I was conflicted because the Japanese resident part of me said, respect the line. But on the other hand, I had been waiting for 15 minutes without much movement. So I did something bold and decided to actually use the app. And what do you know, the driver came and I was safely riding on my way to my Airbnb. I had asked my Grab driver if it was okay to film outside the window while driving. And while on the highway, he let me do this. But when we got into the streets, okay, can I close it? he was eager to get the window closed, as he said you never know who might pop by and snatch my camera. Now the Airbnb was a private residence in a condo tower on the edge of Makati, so like many of these places, there were security guards. Somehow the gun and checkpoints weren't making me feel safer. Interestingly, mall security guards are required to carry guns. I've heard the word security theater tossed around, and if you haven't heard that word before, it's used to describe a situation where it feels like the security is keeping you safe, but in fact, they're really not. On numerous occasions, I was let through without any inspection. And with every inspection, the checks were cursory. I didn't hide anything dangerous in my camera bag, but if I had, not one of the security guards would have found anything. And then there were places where one entrance was guarded, but a side entrance was not. There were also times where I just negotiated my way through things. If you walk the walk or talk the talk, you can be given a pass. So I don't know, I've got to believe that most Filipinos know that these guards aren't doing much in terms of security, but perhaps they've been part of the landscape so long that they've become accustomed to it. And hey, maybe they are deterring some types of crimes with their presence. I don't know. One warning I had from locals was to wear my backpack in front of me as there are lots of thieves in Manila. Indeed, I saw the locals were following this advice. If you've lived in or visited the Philippines, what do you think? Out in the provinces, when you went to someone's local barangay, my local tour guides seemed to ease up on their dire safety warnings. Barangay, by the way, is the smallest local government unit. There are over 42,000 barangay in the Philippines, which means on average, there is one per every two and a half thousand Filipinos. So you'll find barangay halls, which can, but don't always look like this, all over the place. The people living in a barangay will elect a barangay captain. This level of government is empowered to enforce all laws and ordinances, from pollution control and the protection of the environment, to eradicating drug and child abuse. Whether or not this happens in a barangay is a different story. What's different than Japan or Canada is that these very local governmental units exist within bigger governmental units like municipalities and cities. In this barangay, they do have someone managing waste and there are waste bins around. Although while everything is supposed to be separated, it's in fact a jumbled mess. And I don't know what happens to everything that's collected from this point on. If it's anything like waste management systems in Japan or Canada, just because something that can be recycled is collected, it doesn't mean it's recycled. In the local stream nearby, it's clearly not free of trash. And the water's gray from pollution. Beyond the issue of water quality, debris in waterways can clog up storm drains and in the rainy season, exacerbate flooding. 
Using the waterways as trash dumps is partly due to garbage collection issues. Waste management is supposed to be managed at the barangay level, but not all barangays have the same system in place, even if they're supposed to. For example, over here, a business and some residents have to manage waste on their own. This garbage is waiting to go to the dump and is collected once a month. For the plastic bottles, these are recyclable and a little money can be made. And these ducks, they'll produce some eggs. Over here, which looks like it has many informal settlements, it's more haphazard. There's simply waste lying around everywhere. Because of hauling fees and accessibility issues, burning or simply throwing trash into the waterways is a common occurrence. What surprised me was that in this private cemetery, there were also burning garbage. Being private, the place was kept in relatively good order. However, another surprise was the roosters. At the entrance, there were some, but inside was where the more prized ones were kept. This is the Philippines, so there were roosters everywhere. They were hanging out by the garbage dump. They were in someone's yard and outside of a nice condominium unit. This felt so sad that I just had to wait around and see that maybe, just maybe. Nice one. But back to the cemetery. There are basically three levels of burials available. One is in the ground or just above ground. For the wealthiest, there are mausoleums, with some of them even having toilets inside. And for the poorest, there's apartment tombs. A few minutes walk away was where the public cemetery was located. And while they had the same types of tombs, the contrast between them was stark. That'd be like, like here, they put a tarp right over that little area and that's where they're gonna live. Like day to day live? Day to day live. Like get ready, go to school, come back. Whoa. And what do you know? Looking at articles, it is indeed a thing. And so are they leaving drinks for the people or are they no, just. No, that's just trash. So these apartment tombs, they are rented on a five year basis. But because of overcrowding, some don't allow the renewal of the space and the bones are broken out. At this point, if the family doesn't claim the bones, they may get left in a rice bag. If the family does have a bit of money, they can rent a smaller bone box, which is not much bigger than a large shoe box. The thing about these apartment tombs is that there's no way to get up unless you climb. So to pay respect to a loved one, you need to literally climb atop the graves of others. As with many things during my trip, this visit to the cemetery wasn't planned. It was simply a place we happened to stroll by and I inquired about. So let's just randomly move on to a cheerier place of gathering, the mall. When I asked the residents of Manila what a popular activity to do outside of work was, the mall was probably the number one answer. And like any place, I had to get through security first. I honestly didn't spend much more time than I had to in the malls. Beyond my growing dislike of malls and shopping, I just found them to be fairly similar to what I can find in North America. Granted, there are shops you won't find elsewhere and they do have goods that are Filipino. I mean, what could be more Filipino than this place? And on this side of the mall, I don't know if there is one food court restaurant I recognized. Well, except for that Pizza Hut. And here, even though we're in a grocery store, there's a bunch of these little food stalls. I mean, I've seen something kind of like this in North America, but just not so many booths. And check out this walkway music. As I soon found out, finding quiet places in Metro Manila would prove challenging. Although, if you went to the much higher end, you could find a bit more calm, like in Greenbelt Mall. In fact, I interviewed a couple people here due to it being one of the quietest areas I could find. An equally posh shopping area I visited was Bonifacio High Street. If I had to choose any place I visited in Metro Manila that reminded me of something in Vancouver or Tokyo, it'd be this place. Like in Tokyo, you have those places where people line up forever just to get some bubble tea. How long do you have to wait for the bubble tea? Uh, for an hour? One hour? Oh my goodness. I rather liked all the green space where people of all ages and even their pets could enjoy it.
this whole area actually used to be US military land that was then redeveloped. This is also, of course, one of the wealthiest areas in the Philippines, so I'm not surprised it's a nice place. And can I recognize all the Filipinos that love to look at my camera? Is it good? Yeah? It was a mix of hard stares and playfulness. I never knew what I was going to get. Unlike the malls, the markets felt very non-North American to me. In Canada, there are markets, but they are more upscale affairs. In comparison to Basig and Divisoria markets I went to, these are places that you could go to find a deal. I'm told that many small businesses will come here, then go out to the provinces and resell the goods. And in comparison to Japanese markets, these ones in Metro Manila are way more chaotic. There's stuff everywhere, whether it's goods to buy from the stalls, people, or just stuff on the ground. In Divisoria, there's just blocks and blocks of stuff, both outdoors and indoors. The indoor part somewhat reminded me of Akihabara, where you'd find a bunch of little shops like this inside of a building. Now a word of warning. If you don't like seeing animals being butchered, skip ahead about 60 seconds to get to safety. And here we go. While in Pasig Market, I followed along with Nicole and her father as they picked up ingredients for some home-cooked meals. To tell you the truth, the markets felt like the Wild West to me. <laughs> There was a pig head waiting to be made into sisig. Sisig, oh, okay. Blood in the buckets and on the floor. The merchants, though, playful as always. Well, in Divisoria, you can find the pig on the floor. Here in Pasig, you can find it on the table. All right, the butchering meat section is over, so you can open up your eyes again if you had them closed. So in these places, do you ever negotiate prices or do you just know the prices or what? If you so buy from, from them open, you can, yeah, you can bargain for it. You can get anything from the market. One of our stops was to pick up some oil. Another stop was to get pasalubong, or souvenirs for my kids. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> What, what airline are you taking? Yeah, just take a little bit of all the candy. Let's see what the kids think. And of course, we had to pick up some fruits, which are abundant in the Philippines. So what are you doing with all those bananas? Boil them? I think, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Lastly, we stopped by to grab some vegetables for the dishes that Nicole would be cooking. Between busy times, some vendors like to take a bit of a break. All done? Yeah. Okay.
Back in Divisoria, we happened by a parade with a bunch of Jesuses, which, as I was to find out, could be found everywhere. This uh, big one is uh, Santin Santo Nino. Uh, we had a feast uh, yesterday and we celebrated his birth, yeah. And uh, they had a lot of candies oh, wait. Uh, for children. Santo Nino has candy? Yeah. Is this, so is this baby Jesus? Yeah. This is uh, Kamay ni Jesus, the hand of God. And then this is when he was carrying the cross. Yeah. And then... The Holy Family. So Mary, Joseph, and Jesus? Yeah. And then this is... Oh! This is Mary. That's what you call Santo Nino de Palaboy. That's the one that travels a lot. Oh! Um, this is uh, Divina Australia. We have also Immaculate Conception, and then there's Perpetual Health and all different kinds of Virgin Marys. And then every Holy Week, she gets all dressed up and then she gets on a akaro. The Philippines is the only majority Christian nation in Asia. Around 80% of the people are Catholic. I was located in the North, which is mostly Catholic. But in the South, there is a significant amount of Muslims who reside there. Catholicism, of course, was brought to the Philippines by the Spanish when Magellan first arrived in 1521. Although, after going down a Wikipedia rabbit hole for a couple hours, I discovered that Magellan was in fact Portuguese, but sailing for Spain after quarreling with the King of Portugal. He also never left what was to become the Philippines, as he died fighting against the chieftain of Mactan Island, Lapu-Lapu, just one month after his arrival. On June 12, 1898, right here at his home in Cahuit, future first president of the Philippines, Emilio Aguinaldo, declared independence. Both the Spanish and the Americans never recognized this, and instead, Spain ceded the Philippines to the United States on December 10, 1898. This wasn't good news for Aguinaldo, since it was the Americans who brought him out of exile from Hong Kong with the promise of an independent Philippines once Spain was defeated. Although it was him who chose exile after Spain paid him and his top revolutionary compatriots to do so, in exchange for seizing their revolution. Anyhow, I spent another couple hours trying to figure out the true history of Aguinaldo and whether he's a hero or a traitor, and I give up. He's a controversial figure. What I can tell you though, is that his home, the Aguinaldo Shrine, is not only some nice digs, but also has some great mango trees from which you can get free mangoes. Mango hunter. Mango hunter. Oh my god. You got the technique. <laughs> Turn around over there, see? Sure. Oh. Awesome. And if you don't mind. Oh, that's how Filipinos do it? Yeah. I thought you need a knife, but no, you don't. One more. Throw up. <laughs> and oh yeah, finally in 1946, the world recognized Philippines independence. This was after Japan's defeat in World War II, when America finally came through on that whole independence promise given 48 years before. You can see the influence of those foreign countries as you travel around the Philippines. For example, in Tramuros, the old historic part of Manila is Spanish for within the walls. It was constructed by the Spanish during their colonization period. The name of the Philippines comes from the King of Spain, Philip II. This fridge over here, it's Japanese surplus. It needs this power converter to adapt it to the 220 volt electricity in the Philippines. These trains, they're Japanese trains as well. Although looking at this PNR train from the outside, you never know. And these cabinets. This is a Japan surplus. Really? Yes, and it's actually the quality is it's new. So How long yes, ago did I you still buy have the silver from Japan. So there. And these jeepneys, they're based off of US jeeps left over from World War II. This generation of jeepney though, probably has a surplus Japanese engine under the hood. English, that's spoken due to former American rule and education. What surprised me was that the Philippines felt a lot more like Canada than it did Japan, despite it being located in Southeast Asia. Like if you went into a 7-Eleven or Family Mart, both Japanese companies, they don't have a Japanese feel at all and all the chain restaurant choices, they're more what you'd find in North America than Japan, especially the Japanese fast food places. So my guess is that the North American visitor would be way more at home in the Philippines than the Japanese visitor. Okay, so I know this video is getting long, but I still have so much from my visit to the Philippines to talk about. So for those big topics like family, 
food, uh, every time I see mangoes, I'm like, mango! OFWs, income inequality, and tourism, I'll save it for the next one, because there's no way I'll have time to cover it all in this video. What I'll do right now is do something I'll call side notes, which is just a bunch of my random observations, which I guess you could argue is this whole video. Okay, side notes. For me, in Manila, it was noisy everywhere. In the streets with the vehicles. In the malls with the music. In the restaurants and convenience stores with the music. Pretty much any indoor place with the music. Even the parks had music. And even in small villages, it could be quite noisy by the streets. I did find, though, that the more upscale places seemed to have lower noise levels. And if you got more out into nature, there was less noise. See? That's because my drone doesn't record audio. I don't remember capturing footage of this, but I did have it happen several times where a Filipino would burst out into song. That's a good type of noise, though. One thing I knew coming in was that I shouldn't drink the water, so I ended up buying a fairly large bottle. I had to constantly remind myself to not use the tap to fill up my water bottle. I did manage to avoid getting a case of the runs, for the most part. I did have a half day where things were iffy, but it could have been worse. I stayed on the top floor of a 25-story condo, which was my Airbnb while in Manila. It was built as pristine, but the dirty tables and showers said otherwise. Being located in Makati and looking nice on the outside, I was not expecting the cheap construction, like the light wooden door used for the main entrance, the kind of door that's usually used for bedroom doors in Canada. Safety is totally different. For example, this guy in the pole, all by himself, using a ladder that's openly exposed to the street like this, it would never happen in Japan. This glass on the wall, along a small pathway between houses, seems like a big safety risk, especially for the kids traveling around here but perhaps not as big of a risk as the barbed wires, which are right at kid height. And little kids on motorbikes without helmets? Also a common sight. Coming from Japan, the standard of cleanliness? There's a huge gap. One thing I noticed was that in the streets of Manila, you'd end up with this kind of greasy smell that permeates your clothing. It's not just the smell though, because when I washed my clothes in the sink with soap, it was gray afterwards. Kind of like this water. Luckily, I devised a makeshift trying system. One thing that Japan and the Philippines seem to share is pasalubong, which is the practice of bringing back a gift when you travel somewhere. In Japan, it's called omiyage. I know in Canada, we have the concept of souvenirs, but it's just not to the same level of pervasiveness. Everywhere I went, Filipinos were giving me gifts to bring back home to my family. I had so much stuff, I had to give half of it away to the guards as I had no room in my suitcase. It was really nice of them. By the way, even though I worried about safety while out and about with my gear, I was totally fine. Whether through being smart or through dumb luck, I don't know. While in the Philippines, I had to make use of public Wi-Fi, like at the airport and at my accommodations. Because they were open networks, there was a possibility that people could snoop in on my data. To protect myself against that, I used a VPN which encrypts all data coming in and out of my device. For example, I had to book a place to stay for my spontaneous trip to El Nido. That's in the next video, so please be patient. And that VPN connection made sure my personal and credit card information was as safe as possible. I've used several VPNs over the years, but the thing I like the most about my current provider, ExpressVPN, is actually two things. One, it's so simple to use. I click connect, and seconds later, I'm good. Two, it's fast. I ran some tests, and whether connected or not, the speeds were roughly the same. You can sign up for ExpressVPN for less than $7 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Take back your internet privacy today and find out how you can get three months free by clicking the link in the description box, expressvpn.com slash life where I'm from. Take back your privacy today with ExpressVPN. I have so much more to talk about. I really don't know if I'll be able to fit it all into one more video. We'll see. Oh, and in case you missed it, this is actually my second video about the Philippines. My first was about what commuting in Manila was like, so check it out if you haven't seen it yet. Extra special thanks to all those that showed me around the Philippines. I couldn't have done it without all of you. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye. 
if you've traveled to a country that was quite different than yours, what was your experience like?